there was a period in time when Beyonce was in a group, a musical group, called Destiny's Child. There were three of them. It was Beyonce and Michelle, oh goodness, what was Michelle's last name? Williams, Michelle Williams, and Kelly Rowland. One of the most important ideas throughout this course is the distinction between the descriptive, that is, those facts or laws or claims that say how things are, and the normative, that is, those facts or laws or claims that say how things ought to be. So, for example, if there's a movie and it's very popular, a descriptive claim would be that a million people saw this movie. That says how things are. But there might also be a fact about how they ought to be. Maybe it's the case that people should see that movie, or maybe they shouldn't. Those are normative facts. Now, normative facts or normative claims come in at least three varieties. They come in the moral variety, this is the kind of normativity that we've been talking about almost exclusively for this entire course, right? If it's the case that you ought to donate a lot of your money to charity instead of keeping it for yourself because donating it to charity will help other people and that's just the right thing to do, well, that's a moral fact about what you ought to do. But then there are other senses in which you ought to do something. Another sense is called prudential. And that comes from the word prudence, right? It has to do with what's wise for you, given your own interests, given your own aims. What you prudentially ought to do is what's good for you. Uh, take the example of auto manufacturers, right? Uh, in the 20th century, in Detroit, Michigan, there were all these factories and they would build cars. And these were really good middle-class jobs. And the, the folks that worked in the factories, they got their income from, say, General Motors, right? And then they often also got General Motors stock. And they would keep the stock. That is, they would save for their own retirement um, by just holding lots of General Motors stock. This was a bad idea. A colossally bad idea. Why? Because, well, if General Motors does poorly and people aren't buying enough of these cars, then if you work in one of their factories, you might be out of a job. But also, the same time when you'd lose your job, you'd lose your income, General Motors stock would be going down, right? And so you'd lose your savings. Your savings would be, well, less because General Motors stock would be plummeting. And that is the moment in time when you lose your income that you most need your savings, right? So there's a sense in which we might say that, well, you shouldn't. If you're an auto worker, you should not keep your savings in General Motors stock. You should instead keep your savings in the stock of a bicycle company or something like that. What's the nature of that should? In what sense should you keep your retirement savings in the stock of a bicycle company? Well, it's not the sense that it's morally good. I mean, morally, maybe what you should do is keep your retirement savings somewhere else that'll help people. Or maybe you shouldn't keep any retirement savings at all. Maybe you should donate the money to uh, famine relief. Those are moral facts. And they can come apart from facts about what's good for you. And so the sense in which you, as an auto worker, should not keep your retirement savings in General Motors stock is the sense in which it's going to hurt you. It's going to make you poorer. It's going to make you less equipped to provide for yourself and your family if General Motors does poorly and you lose your job. That's prudential morality. Uh, here's one more example. You may be too young to know about this. There was a period in time when Beyonce was in a group, a musical group, called Destiny's Child. There were three of them. It was Beyonce and Michelle, oh goodness, what was Michelle's last name? 
Williams, Michelle Williams, and Kelly Rowland. Those were their names. They were Destiny's Child, and they had some hit songs, right? And then there was a time in the early 2000s, I don't remember exactly when, when Beyonce had to make a decision about whether she should become a solo artist and release a solo album, right? Now Beyonce is Beyonce, right? But it wasn't obvious what she should do. Now it turned out that it was prudentially very good for her to make a solo album. She was incredibly successful, she made lots of money, she became very famous, she married Jay-Z. It all happened because she left Destiny's Child. But that's a fact about what's good for her. There might be some other fact just about what's good for humanity as a whole, or the universe as a whole, or what's good for other people. That's a moral fact. For instance, she may have promised Michelle and Kelly that she was going to stay in Destiny's Child for at least six albums or something. I don't know. If she did make that kind of promise, then there's a, a normative fact saying that she should stay in the group, and that's a moral norm, that you should keep your promises. And then there's an opposing normative fact saying that she should leave the group. But that's a prudential fact, a fact about what's good for her, what's in her best interest. So that's moral and prudential normativity. And then there's at least one more type. And this one doesn't have to do at least directly with action, right? So primarily moral norms and prudential norms they have to do with actions. Some actions are morally good or morally bad. Some actions are prudent or imprudent or wise or unwise, right? But then there's also norms, they're called epistemic norms, and they primarily govern belief, what you ought to believe. So they're still normative. They're just facts about what you ought to believe, rationally speaking, right? So uh, actually, episteme, um, is the Greek word, uh, if you know Greek, you'll know this. I don't know Greek, I only just know enough Greek words to be a philosophy professor. Um, uh, is the Greek word for knowledge. So epistemic norms are norms that are distinctive of knowledge or distinctive of belief. They say what it's rational to believe. Say that um, you're presented with all this evidence. It's a whole bunch of paperwork, right? It's lots of documents. That, say, that show you all the evidence that the Earth is a sphere. And it's photos of Earth from space, and it's all the readouts and published academic papers from all the scientific experiments proving that the Earth is, is a sphere, right? And so you go through all of this evidence, and then there's a fact, you might think, a normative fact about what you ought to believe. And the fact is, based on all of this evidence, you ought to believe that the Earth is a sphere, not that the Earth is, is flat, for example. That's a fact about what it's rational to believe. It's an ought fact, but it's different from what it's prudent to believe, and it's different from what it's moral to believe, right? It might be, although morality and prudence don't sort of characteristically apply to beliefs, they characteristically apply to actions, you might think that believing or coming to believe something is a kind of action, so, you know, it might be the case that it's imprudent to believe that the Earth is a sphere, right? Maybe you're a politician and uh, in your uh, constituency, most people are flat earthers. And so, and you're bad at uh, keeping secrets or lying. So if you believe that the earth is a sphere, well then you're gonna get voted out of, out of office because you're gonna let it slip at some point. And it's gonna ruin your life and then your partner's gonna divorce you and your kids are gonna uh, disown you and your life is gonna fall apart. So it's very imprudent to believe this. So there's a certain sense in which you should believe that the Earth is flat and you shouldn't believe that it's a sphere. But there's another sense in which, look, the evidence says that this is true, that the Earth is a sphere. So there's another sense in which you should believe that the Earth is a sphere, and that's the epistemic sense. And of course, there might be a third sense, right? It might be the case that uh, you're coming to believe this uh, about the Earth will cause you to act in a certain way that will cause great harm to lots of people. If that's the case, then maybe, right, morally, you should believe that the Earth is flat because it will help people if you have that belief and it will harm them if you believe it's a sphere, right? And so moral, uh, moral normativity can oppose epistemic normativity also. Okay, anyway, the point of all this is that there's different varieties of normativity. They're different from one another, right? 
they can conflict with one another, but they're all normative. They're all still facts about what you ought to think or what you ought to do, what you morally ought to do, what you prudentially ought to do, or what you epistemically ought to do. Before we end this, this short video on the descriptive normative distinction, let's just give examples of the varieties of normativity if we understand normativity in terms of laws. Actually, let's do it for descriptive also, right? So we need an example of a descriptive law. The law of gravity, that's a descriptive law. It says that, well, gravity. It says something like objects uh, with mass are attracted to one another with a certain intensity, a certain degree of attraction, whatever that, whatever that number is, right? This is just a description of how things are. This law of gravity, it just describes how things do move, how they are. It doesn't say that objects should be attracted to one another or that they should move towards one another. It just says that they do. It's descriptive. But then there are laws that are normative. They say how things ought to be, right? So the moral law, an example of a moral law, might be one that says, you know, don't murder. That could be a law. Right? We could also phrase it as, you should not murder, or something like that. That says not what people do do, but what they should do, morally speaking. Or there might be a prudential law. Right? A prudential law might be that you should diversify your investments, or that you should um, you know, distance yourself from toxic uh, relationships. Right? If you have a friend or a partner who is dragging you down, there's a law that says that you should distance yourself from them, maybe. And that's a law of what's wise for you, given, what's, given what you need, right? What's good for you, okay? And then if we need a law of epistemology, a law of what it's rational to believe, uh, maybe such a law is something like, um, you know, if an event is very consistent and regular in time, if it happens every day at the same time, then you ought to believe that it's going to happen again the next day at that time, right? So maybe if you observe that the sun rises in the east every morning, then what you ought to do is you ought to believe that the sun will rise in the east tomorrow morning. Maybe that's an example of an epistemic law, something that you should believe. So something like believe, you know, in a regularity. Believe that regularities will continue, something like that. Anyway, these are examples of laws. You have descriptive laws. You have normative laws of all three types. Okay, that's the normative-descriptive distinction. We're going to need that a lot in this course.